I look like shit. Dude, the headphones are 60% of our look on this podcast. Oh, I look like shit. It doesn't matter. Like, I'm a podcaster. Like, I'm not known for my looks. I'm known, I'm known for my voice. Isn't that sad that now podcasters have to be known for their looks also? We're in a new day and age where, like, having a radio voice doesn't get you anywhere anymore. Well, I remember when I um, announced my podcast, Hyphenated, my previous podcast, I was on Ola Magazine with a bunch of other podcasters that were in the same network. And these were the most attractive people you'll ever see in your life. Uh Like, when I was in this photo shoot, I was like, I feel like a goblin trash monster with no legs like this is insane these people are so beautiful (laughs) and then the picture was on twitter and this guy this like big latino podcaster was like all these people are far too attractive to have a podcast and then i was like i'm first of all like so flattered (laughs) make no mistake i take it as the compliment and then i was like oh my god i'm so flattered and then he was like oh no joanne i'm so sorry i didn't mean you 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 for sure should have a podcast (laughs) and i'm like I think what he meant was like, I didn't mean to call you I dumb. I am sure but... he meant many things. You know what? <laughs> Chris and Joanna are close friends with nothing in common. To start a weekly conversation, they ask, can I have a word? I'm going to peak when I'm 80. I'm going to be the fucking hottest 80 year old you've ever seen. I think there is a lot of merit to the idea of peaking when you get older. When, when like you have the confidence of self. You have a no fucks given sort of attitude and you're the most attractive you've ever been. Deadly Tell me something better. Tell me something better. Literally. And also everyone at retirement communities fuck. So much. Because it's like, what else are you going to do? And so it's like, you are going to be able to work it. And that's not bad. It isn't. Also, wives also outlive their husbands all the time. So you've got to just prepare for your second life. My mom is six years older than my dad. And my mom is like, it's great because I'll. I don't know. We'll probably die around the same time. And I'm like, women historically married men like 13, 15, 20 years older than them. Women have like different acts, like in history, women had different acts in their life where like the husband died and there were still like 75 years left. You know what I mean? Like everyone in Alicia's family lived to 100 and everyone in my family lives to around like mid 70s. She's got a solid quarter century to like have another fling in her life. Well, like my grandpa has a girlfriend, a, a French girlfriend. Uh, he started dating when he was like 84 or something. They've been together for 18 years. My grandmother has had three special friends after grandpa died. Ooh, special friends. And then they always die. Oh, no. No, no, no. Don't say oh. If, if everyone, you go into a room and everyone's an asshole, you might be the asshole. I want to know how my grandma's killing these people. I think we need to do a true crime podcast about how you find out that your grandma is a serial killer. Parenthesis, can you see the fact that I did not make my bed? Uh, we should probably introduce this show. This is a show called Can I Have a Word? It's very, very simple. We're just going to pick a word at random, and we're going to talk about it for, um, I, I say 40 minutes. I got 40 minutes on the clock, so we'll talk about it that long. Does that sound good? Um, let me think about it. Yeah, I'm okay with it. Okay, let me revise. 39 minutes. <laughs> the word is censorship. Oh, God. You're going to... Oh, you're going to say censorship? The censorship? Censorship? Yeah. Censorship is the word. To a Venezuelan? Okay. Well, here we go. This is going to be a right. long episode. I'll start it off with something a lot more fun and casual about censorship yes which is uh you and i are firm believers that bleeping out curse words makes it funnier yes so like anytime we ever make anything together we bleep out the curse words because it's funnier well i remember when we started making the videos together univision was like no you you need to bleep the really bad words you can keep shit not bleep but like fuck needs to be bleeped and then when we were just on my channel I remember doing an episode where we weren't bleeping it and I'm like there's something about the bleeps that has evolved it makes it sound more wrong it makes it sound more taboo and inherently what is taboo is what is funny and the bleep just makes you feel like oh it's so naughty naughty you know what I mean versus like fuck yeah I mean you know notably we have not been bleeping this show notably yeah I famously 
Everyone talks about it. The people are talking and they're nonstop saying, I just wish they'd bleep it a little more. I want to be able to like watch it around my my like grandmother. I thought you were going to say child, but okay. Yeah, your grandmother no. can't handle the word fuck. <laughs> no, no, but, but now maybe this is different, you and I, but it's like, there's nothing more mortifying as a child than cursing and realizing your grandparent heard you. I, it's, I think it's one thing if your parent hears you, but if I have like let my grandmother down by saying bitch out loud or something like that, I mortified. Okay, wait, I have a story. Please. I don't know if I told you this story, but okay. It was my college graduation and a bunch of my family had come to Boston for it. Notably, my Cuban grandmother, Belkis Hatar Alonso. Belkis Hatar Alonso was what I would like to call a very strong-willed woman, okay? Mm -hmm. Was really smart. I don't think she enjoyed being a housewife at all and had a very fiery personality, I think, as a result of it. So just for coloring, mm -hmm. the kind of person you want at a party or do not want at a party based on what we have. Now. I would say do not want at a party and had very clear ideas of what women can and can't do. I'm now properly calibrated. Please continue. Unless she has whiskey, because if she had whiskey, <laughs> she would be fun. When I went to a little get together at her retirement home, this woman came up to her to say hi and she didn't say hi back. And I was like, what's going on? Like, why didn't you say hi? And she was like, that woman's a whore. She's having sex with <laughs> Carlos. And I'm like, who cares? And she's like, I do. That's a whore. And it's like, that woman is a widow. Let her have fun. But anyway, so that's my grandma. Anyway, so she comes to my college graduation. And at one point in the weekend, I'm like telling a very funny animated story about something that happened to me. And it like devolved into a lot of like bad words. But one thing I'll say about my grandmother is that even though she portrayed a sense of like a society woman, she had a sailor's mouth. Like she would say yeah. like a lot of bad words in confidence. So I was using a lot of bad words to tell the story. And I could tell she was being very quiet and being very like, I didn't know she was listening, by the way. I but I like picked up that she listened and I could tell mm -hmm. she was being very quiet and whatever and this. So like the weekend continues and she's like not talking to me very much. And then she's like, I have to speak to you in my room in private. And I was like, fuck. That, I actually that's didn't say the tone fuck. that I actually says. didn't say fuck. No, I said beep. <laughs> <laughs> I go into her room and she sits me down and she's really sweet. And she's like, my, my love, my granddaughter. I don't like the way you talk. The way you talk is disgusting no man of society is going to want to marry you and you will be living alone for the rest of your life and i was like for context i'm graduating college i don't think my yeah, yeah, yeah. priority right now is to marry a quote man of society which i don't even know what the fuck that means like what society <laughs> like, are we talking you're about marrying gatsby later gatsby's on the line and and oh no she said fuck gatsby no longer wants to marry her uh, <laughs> turn off the champagne fountain so for me, that was a moment and like at like many moments like that, I felt like my sense, like how I was naturally, my personality had to be censored to be desirable. Yeah, yeah you were being informed that you have to present a certain way in order to like succeed at what your family thinks you need to be succeeding at, which apparently is to be married off for, to the highest bidder. Which is funny because my mom is famously like one of the most, the word is grosera in Spanish, but like she'll say a sentence that's like 90% a curse word and then everyone's mm -hmm. like oh my god joanna how did you how did you come out so like foul mouthed and i'm like what did you expect look and venezuelans are i'd say very foul mouth like generally in in, in the the words and vernacular that we've like in added i'd say 90 percent mean something sexual or bad i like Berga, que caga, weón. i would say that sentence and that means dick what shit big bald man so that's like a sentence. I appreciate how you translated that to not sound like a sentence at all. That sounded like toddler talk. <laughs> Surprise, now. you find out that actually I have the Spanish brain of a toddler. This whole time, you're like, she's fluent. <laughs> <laughs> You've been so confident all these years that we've known each other that you're like, I got Spanish down. People love me. And then it's just, you're talking to uh, in another language. It's just, gaga, gugu, dick fuck. Yeah, that's actually how I talk. That, that was in your vows. It was. How did you know? I had someone translate for me. That was very kind of them. Have you ever felt censored? Like, have you ever been like, oh, God, because yeah, you speak very loudly. I'll, I'll say that about you. You're a very yeah, loud yeah, yeah, yeah. speaker. I feel like you're constantly censoring yourself. 
I am aware now as an adult the space that I can take up, and I try to moderate that. I, don't, I wouldn't call that censorship show. I'm, I'm just trying to read the room, right? Like mm-hmm. I do remember, though, as a kid, I got bullied a lot as a kid. I moved around a lot as a kid, and um, one of the ways that I tried to like keep going when you like make new friends or whatever is just like jokes and like being like a funny person more or less and I remember getting in trouble all the time anytime I did organized sports because I would just spend the entire sport catcalling insults at the kids who were actually doing the work while I was just standing on the sides specifically I remember I got pulled from a soccer game because I kept chasing a kid who was like with the ball and I just kept calling him a fart knocker over and over again you were made for the capitalist corporate structure where you did none of the work and yelled the most. That is what working in a big company is. You- I think that's looking too far ahead at what mm. my skill set could bring. I think in that moment, people were just mad that I wasn't embracing a sport that because I was a tall kid, I was assumed I would be able to be athletic enough to do it. When in all, all actuality, I never cared a whole lot. I just really liked just shouting rude things at kids which then evolved into your career which is director yeah yeah but i'm not am i okay is not me not me not mean i mean i'm not i'm i'm i i'm well, not in a mean way i feel like you've no, grown no, no. up and we, you're no longer mean oh but there was a time i was mean uh, clearly you called a boy f- fart knocker no, yeah yeah from beavis and butthead oh i'm never i didn't know that remember i have these blind points in american culture i i, have, I would I, say Beavis and Butthead can stay a blind point. I think it's a show that would only have ever made sense in its context of time. And now I don't think anybody finds it funny anymore. And that should be censored. We should censor Beavis and Butthead. (laughs) Censor some 90s show nobody can find anymore. I think that's top priority. But yes. Wait, wait, have I been mean? Now now I'm in my head about this. Have you you experienced me as a mean director? No, you're a mean friend, but you're not a mean (laughs) director. Fucking hell. <laughs> no, you're not a mean director. You're a very nice director. You're like a you're like a director that like, you know, you feel taken care of. And I remember one time we were on set and I was being really mean to you and you pulled me aside and you're oh, like, Oh, I hey, remember this. Thing, you were like, Hey, is everything okay? And I was like, Yeah, why? And you were like, You're being so mean to me. And I'm like, Oh my god, I didn't I know exactly what it was. You had a friend that you just like really wanted to impress. No, wait, which one? Friend of us, Richie Moriarty. <laughs> Oh, he was set with us, and you just were having so much fun with him. And every time I interjected, it was like, "What the fuck do you want?" <laughs> the feeling every single time I'd be like, "Hey, I'm thinking maybe at this part." Yeah, I mean, we do that if we weren't funny. <laughs> it was like a moment of like, "Oh, I, oh, I crossed the boundary." Because with friends that you work with, you do have to flip a switch on and off. And my the switch yes. had not flipped. Well, to, to talk to it of censorship, there is a point in any intimate relationship, whether it be romantic or otherwise, where your your walls of what you would regularly not say in front of people go away. And then you just start becoming your most transparent self. That's when you find out whether they're a ride or die or not. It's like, can they handle me when I am agitated and not even thinking about what I say when I say it? So there's this philosopher, I guess it's Adam Smith, but I he wrote this thing called the... Something of moral sentiments. This sounds like an online quiz that I would take if I was worried about my future. And I was like reading it and I'm like, I literally don't understand a word. But the whole conceit is basically like society judges people. And it's like if you saw someone yelling the words pee pee poo poo pee pee poo poo down the street and and like you'd be like that person is crazy and I want nothing to do with them. But if you were here visiting me and I knew that you had like, I don't know, taken an edible and you started screaming pee pee poo poo down the street, I would say, that's not Chris. Chris was just under a crazy, it has having a crazy day, but that's not him. He's not crazy. The more you get to know people, the more you justify their actions and understand them and, and, and you don't create society in a way that it's like these people are normal and these people aren't because your, yeah. your people start acting abnormally. I might have read that book very incorrectly, by the way. Um, A a philosophy, I'm sure. What I take from that is the idea that, like, once someone's in your inner circle, you'll excuse anything because they have been vetted enough. And to start questioning them now means that you have to question your entire vetting process, i.e. how you actually form relationships. I have, oh, you know this. I have a sense of humor that, like, there's people in the world I can do it with. And then there's people in the world that, like, I can't. Have you ever done the group, like, group A sense of humor to friend group B. And it's like, oh no, I think they're judging oh. me. 
all the time. I mean, this this happen this happens with my partner and I in terms of how we even talk about our daughter. Like, we find it funny just to be like, "Oh, she's just a stupid little baby. She's just." What a what a so dumb, dumb little sack of meat. And every person that isn't you or people like you go, she's not dumb. She's developing on her own speed. And it's like, we fucking know that. She's also just a dumb little shit right now. And it's funny. I made the mistake of, um, you, you know, we, we have this joke where I say, I'm not a Republican, but, and then I continue to say something really, really I don't I don't know that it's a joke. I don't think it's a joke. I think at this point, it is a foundational <laughs> thing that you and I are allowed to admit to each other where we go, listen, I'm not a Republican. But, but wait, wait, talking about censorship, I'm going to, I'm going to get on a hot topic here. Please. So. As I am maturing and growing older, I'm noticing that there is not one group, one political faction, one religion, one anything that I like fully and totally believe in and like adhere to 100%. But I do feel that we're in an era where if you don't, you can get canceled. Like, you know, I live in LA. Yeah. And I am a liberal. And I personally don't think people should live in tents anywhere they want. So I think public spaces need to be enforced. I said that in a dinner that I should not have. <laughs> and I felt censored. Chris, I felt censored, okay? Well, I felt okay, censored. But, but let's use my previous language. Did you feel like you had read the room? I, I Well, since I just moved here and like I'm, I haven't gotten those friendships where I'm like, even if they disagreed with me, they'd be like, oh, okay, shut the fuck up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was like, I could tell the... The, there was a tonal shift in the entire room where people were like, uh-huh. Ugh. and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think there should be safety nets in society to not allow this to occur. But, and they're like, they're like, abort, <laughs> abort, abort. <laughs> yeah, it was going so well, but you went anywhere towards center. But I do feel like if we do live in a world and I'm working on this, where like, we're afraid to be with people that don't 100% agree with everything we say. Yes. And I don't agree with that. Absolutely. I love being friends with people I don't agree with. It actually makes me feel better about the world because I think there was a time in my 20s where I'm like, I cannot believe this person would fucking write that and I'm not going to talk to them anymore. And I'm like, I like them. They have, they're funny. Okay. (laughs) Why not? I wasn't letting myself like have a different perspective, point of view. What you're not complaining about right now is that everyone else in the room didn't agree with you. What you are stressing is that it didn't feel like there was room for that to be the start of a conversation and that instead it was immediately like, oh, I can't be here anymore. I literally felt like I said a slur at the Thanksgiving table. I it's very funny and ironic because like I spent December in South Carolina with my husband's extended family and a lot of them don't have my political beliefs. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was a moment where one of his family members made a joke about me losing my job in Hollywood. And I thought it was because of the strike. Right. So me coming from uh-huh. a liberal California, I'm like, yeah, the strike. No, but actually. And he's like, no, no, no. I meant because of wokeism. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, wokeism is going <laughs> to destroy comedy. I can tell you there's not one thing we agree about in this totally. world. Maybe maybe about like how delicious the tacos were that night. Everything else we didn't agree with. But we had a very nice conversation and we didn't get worked up. I think it's very difficult to go into every single conversation feeling like your prime objective is to change hearts and minds. No, thank it you. It sort of robs you of your ability to listen and like hear someone else and have a back and forth and have a takeaway from it. I would deal with this in the Midwest more if I hadn't grown up around the most apathetic people to what was going on in the world. Oh, <laughs> I feel like, right. Here's a good example. I don't know that I can tell you any member of my family that knows that it's an election year this year. They're just, they're far from politics and they're like busy with their day-to-day life. Isn't that, is it, but isn't that, isn't that, isn't that an example of a functional society where people are like, I don't care? Yes. I I mean, it's difficult when you care about a thing to then be around others who don't care. I understand that sort of six. But like, I didn't grow up watching the news. I didn't grow up having like any of those sort of difficult conversations about the world because they were completely aloof to them. Mm. Because it's like at the end of the day, if it doesn't impact you on a local level, what does it do? And now... 
thanks to internet, it feels like there are a bunch of people unable correctly speak uh, their opinions are suddenly being forced to always speak their opinions. And they were like, I, I, wa- I didn't ask for this. Just, I, I want to read a newspaper. I want to read a sports section and I want to sit on my porch. I talked about this in therapy recently because um, I don't know if you know this. I suffer from anxiety. <laughs> no. We were talking and she was like, yeah, like, what do you think made you so anxious like growing up? And I'm like... Well, I moved around a lot as a kid. Um, when I was four, there was a coup d'etat, and my parents thought we were going to die. Um, then we moved, and then um, all my parents could talk about was how a dictator was taking over checks and balances of our country, and my family back home was slowly losing their rights, and I felt like democracy was slipping through our fingers. And like, and, and my, my therapist was looking at me like, wait, what? Like, this was a new therapist. So for me, like, politics has been... It's like an integral part of the table, of like the dinner table. And one of the things I really enjoyed, like hanging out with my in-laws and stuff was like, they would just talk about what they did or like what they were going to eat the next meal. And I'm like, this is so relaxing. (laughs) My parents would be like, Pinochet in Chile and the disappeared Argentinians. And I'm like, this is, I'm eight. The joy of having a meal, you're having lunch. And then as you conclude lunch, the conversation becomes, well, what are we going to have for dinner? <laughs> is what a beautiful, a, what a wonderful way to live life. You know that scene in American Beauty where the guy is like talking to the girl and he's like, look at this plastic bag. Like it's just floating in the wind and it's so beautiful. That is me looking at a scene of just like a normal family having the most boring dinner conversation. Just like it's just people talking, but it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? My stepmother tells stories that are awfully benign of no note to anything. And she doesn't think to like edit any of the details out. It's all stream of consciousness, minute by minute, like shoot notes of what happened. For example, it could be like, well, I went to the grocery store the other day because they had a sale on watermelon. Watermelon is a type of melon that's green on the outside and red on the inside. So I went to go get that watermelon and the dang price on the side wasn't the same as what it said in the newspaper. So I got pissed off. And so I go find the first store clerk. They don't know nothing about the price. So I got to go find the next store clerk. And she just keeps going. 25 minutes later, you find out she's got a quarter off this watermelon. And this is the story I have heard her tell five times that day to each one of the kids as they come up to her. I think it's something really nice about like... That's that isn't that's enough for a story for her. Meanwhile, like I, I, I almost crashed on the highway on the way here to this record and the guy flicked me off and I'm like, that's the least interesting thing that's happened to me in a while. There's yeah, no yeah, yeah. That, there's that's no that's not point. even a footnote what happened today. Why not live a more peaceful life, you know? Oh, yeah, let's all let's all just like you know what? Let's just get lobotomies. Let's just get lobotomies. You know what's not helping me in my life? Is this damn thinking brain. It's crazy how in the 50s there was this era of like the suburb and what the American dream was and then but there was war so then there was people subverting it and then just a bunch of people were put into a sane asylum like one in four people one in four families had someone in an insane asylum because society was like it turns out they were just like probably ADHD but like people are like we don't know what to do with these people and I think that was like an effort to sanitize like thinking that felt scary or like something that disrupted the status quo right it's like when reporters are allowed to see pyongyang and it's just like a model home of what a village is supposed to look like and they don't want you to see any of the bad it's like we shuff- we shuffled off anything that didn't look like traditionally nuclear because it- it's too upsetting to think that it couldn't be just this wait are you talking what pyongyang you've ever seen like when the journalists go to north korea and they're like oh north korea yes 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 and it's just like people yeah. like acting like it's, it's, it's children and they're like we have a we have a computer lab we promise and then they're sitting there and they're just they're not even touching the mouse or the keyboard they're just staring at a blank screen and you're like we're not we're not going to question that because we'll get kicked out of this country if we do it's like that but we send people to asylums yes and then lobotomy started happening because people were like it'll it'll be so much better if they just can't think and honestly they might yeah. be right but i think we're actually onto something now what if the problems of our world today is that we are all just thinking about it too much I think the problems of our world today is that our problems have become so easily fixable that we have to start creating them. Give me an example. I 
I'm hungry. All right, I'm, I'm going to pull up my phone and literally order any food I want. My stomach hurts. Okay, I'll just drink some Pepto-Bismol. I'm sleepy. I have a $1,000 mattress, literally the most comfortable mattress you've ever seen. But then it's like, what is my meaning in life? And then we've craft religions. And then we're like, we have to, this is a God. And then it's like, this guy thinks another God is, is the God. And I, now I can kill him. Like if we were just scavenging and just trying to find food and survive, how much you want to fucking bet half of the world's, pro- I mean, we would just be trying to survive. We wouldn't be here like, you know, crafting our problems, like literally pulling them out of our asshole. I just had pulling a- problems out of our asshole. <laughs> I just had a moment of seeing what you're going to look like in 30 years. Why? Because like, that was all over the place. Do you not, Did you not listen for a second? That I thought it like was a, so smart. Not even close to concise. You what went are from you talking Pepto, about? You went from Pepto-Bismol <laughs> to fucking solving I just, world crisis. No. I understand the idea that instant gratification has caused us to think all of our problems are harder because we can't solve them quick enough. I understand that. I think you want me but, to get a lobotomy because I'm thinking so creatively you can't even follow it. I well, this is. I am curious. If you ever had like a lobotomy, would you still keep your sense of humor? That's what I want to know. Uh, I mean, you're asking me if, as if, if if there was a menu, and they're like, we're gonna get rid of yeah, your yeah, brain, yeah, but yeah. you can't have a sense of humor. But if there was a menu, you'd be interested, right? If there was a menu that was just like, well, we can take out a little bit of the anxiety part. Let's just go a boop boop, and it's out of here. You would absolutely consider it in the middle of the night, one night. I know I would. I would. I would. I'm scared because now like Elon Musk is making a chip you put into your brain. So now I'm like, is this the future? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Are we going to are we going to be able to hack the brains and just adapt us to be the people that we want to be? I don't know. That's really scary. Yeah. I I think it's uh, funny that you brought up. <laughs> hey, do you remember that? Do you remember that we wanted levity when we do these conversations? <laughs> I always find it so interesting that the first step of a dictator, like the first step of anyone who is like wanting full and total control is the, the first thing they do is censorship. It's like if the, these dictators get a little booklet and they're like, mm, I want to be a dictator. And then it's like step one, censor people. Does it feel like you wish you wish a dictator handbook would have a more creative first step? I wish that we as people weren't, It's so sad to see how every dictator kind of followed a similar path. And that makes me sad because I'm like, are we really that predictable? And also we saw it happen before and it keeps happening. I find the censorship of North Korea, like the Venezuelan censorship is like, oh yeah, people that say their opinions against the government, they're censored. And I think North Korea is almost, it just takes it to another extreme where it's like your haircut and the names you give your children. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They are hardcore. It's like you, you work yourself into the minor leagues and you work yourself up to major leagues and major leagues is the big game. And that's where the big kids play. Kim Jong-un. Do you like how I, I you like how I'm so out of my depth to talk about political dictatorship? <laughs> like speaking of Midwest apathy, I'm like, I have I have what I read in the news a couple of times to pull from on this. I and think, does that disappoint you to be my friend? <laughs> no, I don't. I think you've probably just had... I was going to say you had a more healthy childhood, but I know for a fact you didn't. <laughs> I know. Di- di- different, but the same. Different, but the same. Here's a, good, here's a question. Did you come up with fake curse words as a kid? Like, you didn't say fuck, you said freak? Or things like that? Yeah, I did. I did. What? Do, I, do, I hated it. Do you it. remember any of them that were notable? You you um, hated it. You, you did it, but you hated it. Or are you hating it in hindsight? My grandmother... Um, made up a bad word, several. And one of them was mm-hmm. mango verde, which means green mango. And in order for her not to say a bad word. Um, and I remember saying mango verde and it didn't have the catharsis of coño de la madre o maldita puta, you know? It, it didn't mm-hmm. feel... Ugh. Well, that's that's what you want out of a curse word is like you want it to feel like it is the weight of an emotion you are trying to communicate coming out. That's what makes it so sucky when you talk to somebody that curses all of the time is they're taking the power away from the curse word by using it so often. OK, because I think I use bad words way too much. Like I do. I, I For me, fuck has the same weight as like thing. Like I, I don't feel like I respect curse words anymore. I still try to respect them. I, I appreciate what they can do in a moment. I, I think I curse a lot in work environments, but I try to do it in a way to like undercut like a moment of tension. I try not, I try not to just like whip it out all of the time. And I, so in that way, I feel like I'm being very calculated about it. 
this is my way of just justifying that I still talk like a sailor in front of people. But I don't think you say fuck that much. I don't think you say fuck uh, so much that it diminishes its importance. I think you use it casually. But There's an article that says that people that curse are more intelligent than people that don't. So I believe it. I think there's an article that always says someone is more intelligent if they do the thing the writer does a lot. Oh, for sure. I've, so I've read articles that it's like people who enjoy bad movies are just smarter. And it's like, you can't. It's okay to have like a dumb part of your brain. It doesn't have to ever. Not everything has to be about elevating your intelligence. I think the smartest people I know are the ones that say that they're the that they have the dumbest part of their brain. Like the smartest people are not always like, I'm really dumb at that. But the dumbest people I know are always like, I am good at everything. <laughs> and everything, there's this quote I love, which is like, oh God, what is it? Um, the people who are the dumbest are the most sure. And the people who are the smartest are the least certain. Which I fucked that up. I fucked that no, up. No, no, no. Like, but I, I know, I know what it is you're saying. It's like the intelligent part is to admit fallibility, admit weakness, and invite in something that might be stronger at it than you. Yes. And it's like not what you get when people are just like, "I gotta be the best, right? I ain't like a man. I gotta look smart. Sh- shut up." Or people who like po- post their opinion online with like very little information. Like people that are like not. Are like, hey, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say my opinion right now because I just, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't have enough information. And then the people with the least amount of information are always like, this is why I think this. And it's like, <laughs> you, why, like, why is ignorance and stupidity so linked to a feeling that like you have the right to say what you think? I don't know. But that's that's not a good question for two people that are hosting a podcast to answer. My God, we made this podcast to talk bullshit. What am I even saying? Wow. I didn't mean to let right. you down. I didn't mean to like bring you down. You know what is bringing me down right now? I have 7% left on my laptop and I have to go get my charger. This is so me. This is so you. I, I, we should just wrap it up. Can I just Wait. can I just leave with a Can I just oh. leave with like one thing? No. Can yes. I tell you the can I tell you the the my funniest my favorite combination of curse words? Um I I wanted to guess but yeah tell him tell me. I think the best combination of curse word to get a reaction is to call someone a fucking butthole. <laughs> if you call someone a fucking butthole, they don't know what to do with you. <laughs> they You're don't know. So right. You know what I like about it? It's not gendered because gendered curse words make me feel a little uncomfortable. Everyone has a butthole. If you don't have a butthole, talk to someone about getting a butthole. You need one. You should get, I give it a 10 out of 10. I'm telling you now, that's where the poop comes out. You need a butthole. But you need one, but you don't want to be one. You don't want to be a butthole. butthole. And butthole sounds more playful than asshole. Butthole is one of the most juvenile insults you could possibly say. So to pair it with what, at least when we were growing up, was the strongest curse word allowed to be said is a very good juxtaposition that leaves a feeling no matter what room you say it in. Okay. I'm going to start using butthole. Fucking butthole. I want you to think of a word that isn't censored that you think should be. Um, uh, so the phrase circle back. Okay. So you would send, if you were I a dictator, you, you would be like circle back. Not in this. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to hit corporate culture. My first, my first effort as a dictator is to shut down lazy corporate culture. We are not circling back on this later. We're done. We're talking about it now. Mm. What's your word? Don't don't say moist. Everyone says no, moist. no, 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 no. I actually like the word moist. I think it's like cute and like interesting. Wait, okay. Um, no, I'm sorry. What's cute and interesting about moist? <laughs> it's like moist. I'm not moist. saying it's a great word. I'm just saying it's basic to cancel. Moist. Moist. It's like it sounds. It sounds like an onomatopoeia for like what a little animal noise would be. Moist. 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 Okay. <laughs> you are uh, about to do dishes, and you need to get your rag wet so that you can wash the dishes off. How wet does it need to be? It has it's just moist. See, pretty cute. The word I think I would. Oh, um, fucking um, oh god, eh, um. <gasps> <gasps> Wait, I'm I'm I, I cannot remember it. It's is, a is word. Is it your laptop's battery or your battery? What's going on? It okay. Wait, 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 Chris. It's it's a word that I can never spell. Okay. Because I I think what I would do is I would censor words that 
the spelling is just illegal and shouldn't be that way. You know what I okay. mean? So so the state of Mississippi is toast. Immediately. <laughs> I cannot spell immediately. Oh, really? Immediately. Immediately. I can't do it. I hate it. And I also think when you ask for something immediately, that's aggressive. I think it's it's a bad spelling. It sets uh, it sets an impossible precedent. Precedent. Hey, precedent is a word I can never spell, bro. You know what? Let's censor precedent too. I can't spell yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I think if I were a dictator, I'd be like, if I was on a at a chalkboard, <laughs> and I had to write something, and I can't spell it, and I'd be embarrassed. Immediately censored. Immediately censored. <laughs> that now listen, now listen. That is <laughs> that is the initial dictator broadcast i want to see i want to see a dictator at a chalkboard being like someone tell me words if i can't spell it it's toast chavis did that he like basically he had like a three-hour game show where he would play the xylophone and like be like i don't know i feel like firing people today ding 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 you're fired i remember you showing me this clip and it was outrageous that this existed i mean if i were a dictator i'd want to be outrageous and i think that that's such a great like like show idea it's like people like like, and people can call in like hey can you spell february let's find out f e e b there's an Um, r there gone gone and now the month of february either needs a new name or just no longer exists that one's named Toast because I know how to spell toast. I think this is such a great idea. It would create a cleaner and more or more succinct and simple society. So what we are left with is the task at hand of forming our own dictatorship. <laughs> I think I think I think your parents will have something to say about that. What what a what a shocking turn of events. Now, is this the kind of humor you'd have to censor in front of your parents right now? You're like joking about dictatorship, but they they fully feel the weight of dictatorship on their yeah, lives. Yeah, I think that I think they'd be like, Joanna, this is the dinner table. You should not be joking. <laughs> you're using you're using group A humor with group A exactly. family. Group F, group it, family humor. In honor of your family, I have bleeped out the last two minutes. And now it's funnier. Fuck. <laughs> okay. It's been good talking to you. I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>